Good evening and welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 28th of July 2021. And in this programme uh, tonight, I thought we'd do something a little bit different, uh, considering that the, uh, the delayed Olympics are taking place in Tokyo right now. It, this may be a good time to reflect and go back to one of the greatest Olympic stories of all time. And uh, maybe you've guessed it, the rivalry between Eric Liddell and Harold Abrahams in the Paris Olympics of 1924. And what lessons can we learn from that uh, incredible uh, Christian hero in Eric Liddell? Um, Reagan, I, I, I love talking about sports. So this is a little bit of a departure from us. We're not talking about some of the major news headlines or, or major prophetic developments, but we are really talking about one of the greatest Christian sportsmen of all time in Eric Little. Oh, without question. I remember the first time I heard about Eric Little, it would have been at, um, like a holiday Bible club of some sort in the United States and they actually showed the film Chariots of Fire, which- In the States. Uh, well. Yeah, in the, at the, in the States um, and, um, you know, the soundtrack, Vangelis, incredibly powerful. I have to confess at the time as a child, I, um, I, I found the film interminably long, um, <laughs> but then in years to follow, uh, it was incredibly inspirational. And, and then some years later, um, I remember um, returning to um, the topic through visiting a, a book signing with um, some family where this book, Running the Race, was released by a sport historian, John W. Ketty. Great book that talks about him as a champion and as a missionary. Um, I've always found the story very inspirational, a man of conviction, character, um, who, as we'll see, even um, died in the cause of Christ. So um, great, great story, extremely inspirational. Um, they even, in addition to the film, I don't know if you, you knew, they had a, a stage production a few years ago. And um, I went to see that in the West End and um, anything Eric Little that comes out, I generally um, try to have a look at, including um, a film that was, I have to say, quite rubbish um, on Wings of Eagles. Avoid that one, guys. Um, yeah, that's because it was, it was, it was Chinese and uh, they wanted to take out his kind of Christian character. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, well, I first became aware of Eric Liddell, I think, when I was at school. So I uh, read his autobiography when I was 13. Mm. I was into running, I was athletics, that was, that was my main thing at school. And then to read his biography just had a, an absolute profound impact upon my life. And uh, that's when I decided that, hey, I'm not going to run on a Sunday. Yeah. That, that's the Lord's day. Yeah. And the uh, Lord blessed me through it. I got a, a lot of ridicule, as you can imagine, at school. Uh, for doing so, but I think what that then developed was that that strength of character, uh, and I've always been one. If the crowd are going that way, I always go that way. Absolutely. So it, it's always been my nature. But I mean, Eric Little himself. I mean, uh, an incredible inspiration. The fact that we are only three years away from the hundredth anniversary of the uh, the Paris Games of 2024 is an indication of what an incredible legacy that he's left behind. How his story um, compels uh, sports writers, journalists, Christians, even now, almost approaching 100 years on from that incredible events that took place in Paris 24. But also I think what the film does well, uh, Chariots of Fire, is it brings two stories together. The story of he uh, Harold Abrahams, who was uh, Jewish, who faced mm -hmm anti-Semitism at uh, the University of Cambridge, wanting to be accepted uh, by British society. Uh, uh, and then the passionate uh, Eric Liddell, who, uh, who was de a devout Christian who stood on his principles. Uh, and what it really shows, I think, is God's heart, both for uh, the Jews and Christians. And it's that story that they both share that platform. Now, uh, this is an old video. That, uh, that I recorded back in 2017, so it's uh, more than four years old. And uh, this is me telling the story of the great man himself, Eric Liddell, known as the Flying Scotsman. A few weeks ago, it was the 70th second anniversary of the death of a Christian sporting legend and childhood hero of mine, Eric Liddell, fondly known as the Flying Scotsman. Eric was famously known for his success 
at the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, and his story was brought to the big screen by the Oscar-winning film Chariots of Fire. Eric was more than a sportsman because his entire life was dedicated to the Lord, and after his Olympic success, he would return to China as a missionary to follow in the footsteps of his parents. Tragically, he would die in a Japanese prison or war camp in the last few months before the end of the Second World War. Eric Liddell's story begins in China, as he was born to Scottish missionary parents on the 16th of January 1902 in Tetsin, northern China. In 1908, Eric was only six when his parents sent him and his older brother to Britain to attend the Eltham College in Blackheath, a boarding school for children of missionaries. It would have been difficult for Eric growing up without his parents, who were working as missionaries in China. Eric, during his childhood, would only see his parents, his sister and younger brother a few times at the family home in Edinburgh. Eric, in 1920, joined his older brother, Robert, at Edinburgh University, where he started his BSc, Pure Science Degree course. It was at university that the young Eric would excel at sport and he would represent Edinburgh University in athletics in the 100 metres and 200 metres, respectively. He would go on and compete for Scotland. He was also a fine rugby player and would later go on to play seven internationals for Scotland. He gave up playing rugby, deciding to specialise in running with his ambition of reaching the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. He became known as the fastest runner in Scotland and his athletic achievements would be reported in the newspapers that raised expectation that he could be an Olympic champion. Glasgow Students Evangelistic Union approached Eric to speak at their meetings because he was a deeply committed Christian and his fame would attract large crowds to hear Eric share the gospel. Eric Liddell's main rival to win the Olympic gold at the 1924 Paris Olympics was Harold Abrahams, who was Jewish and was the son of immigrants from Lithuania, and his father was a successful financer. Harold attended Cambridge University, where he faced anti-Semitism, and it was these experiences that would be the driving force in his life. He wanted to prove to his peers that he was going to be the best. A year before the Paris Olympics in 1923 at Stamford Bridge in London, now the home to Chelsea Football Club, that Eric and Harold Abrahams would compete against each other for the first time in the 100 metres. Eric was the winner that day with his unorthodox running style beating Harold by four metres and that defeat hurt Abrahams. Abrahams, after this defeat, hired a professional coach in Sam Musabini to help him to achieve Olympic glory. In the 1920s, sport was still very much an amateur pursuit and by hiring a professional coach, he was looked down upon by the establishment of Cambridge University. Harold Abrahams would be looking for revenge against Eric Liddell in the 100 metres race at the Paris Olympics. He would also be up against the Olympic favourites, the Americans, Charlie Paddock, the Olympic champion, who was looking to defend his title, and Jackson Schultz, nicknamed the New York Thunderbolt. It was Eric Liddell's deep Christian faith and convictions that would prevent him from competing for the Olympic gold in the 100 metres against his main British rival, Harold Abrahams. Eric was the nation's favourite to win gold for Britain, but when Eric found out that the heats for the 100 metres were to be held on a Sunday, he went with his conscience and pulled out the event. Eric did this because he strongly believed that Sunday was God's day of rest and he would not compete. Eric Liddell's decision not to run on Sunday created an angry backlash in the British press with headlines like, Liddell puts God before king and country. Huge amounts of pressure were placed upon Eric to reverse his decision, but he refused, deciding to stand firm in faith and fearing God rather than man. Eric would go to the Paris Olympics and would compete in the 200 metres and in the 400 metres, in which he was not expected to do well. Eric would win bronze in the 200 metres final, behind the winner, Jackson Schultz and Charlie Paddock. Harold Abrahams would compete in the final of the 100 metres without his nemesis, Eric Little, but to win gold for Britain, he would first have to beat Jackson Schultz and Charlie Paddock, the favoured Americans. This would be Harold's chance for glory, 
and his opportunity to vanish the anti-Semitic prejudice he faced while at university. The professional training that Abrahams had gained under his coach Sam Massabini had paid off as he beat the Americans to win gold for Britain. Harold Abrahams would return to Britain and Cambridge University as an Olympic champion. He would also bring honour to the Jewish community in Britain. On Friday the 11th of July 1924 was the final of the 400 metres in which Eric Leder would compete for Great Britain. In the heats Eric had qualified for the final but was not expected to win gold as this was not his favoured event. It says in the old book, he that honours me, I will honour. I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Against all odds, Eric won gold for Britain and broke the Olympic and world record in the process. The Lord honoured Eric that day in the final for the stand that he made for him because he was not seeking his own glory, but God's glory. He demonstrated his strong faith in the Lord by not competing on Sundays and God rewarded him with a gold medal and a world record. Eric said of his, of his success in winning gold, the secret of my success over the 400 metres is that I run the first 200 metres as hard as I can. For the second 200 metres, with God's help, I run harder. The Scottish newspaper reported Eric Liddell's success in the following way. The Union Jack flew in proud majesty over Columbus Stadium today. The 400 metres, which resulted in a great victory for Great Britain. The brilliant running of E.H. Liddell, the Edinburgh University sprinter, was responsible. There was a gasp of astonishment when Eric Liddell, one of the most popular athletes at Columbus, was seen to be a clear three yards in head of the field at half the distance. Nearing the tape, Finch and Butler strained every nerve and muscle to overtake him, but could make absolutely no impression on the inspired Scott. With 20 yards to go, Finch seems to gain a fraction, but Liddell appeared to sense the American, and with his head back and his chin thrust out in his usual style, he flashed past the tape to gain what was probably the greatest victory of the meeting so far. Certainly there has not been a more popular win. The crowd went into a frenzy of enthusiasm when it was announced on the loudspeaker that once again the world record had been gone by the board. This remarkable achievement confirms the view that the quarter mile is Liddell's best distance. Eric would later say, following this success at the Paris Olympics, it has been a wonderful experience to compete in the Olympic Games and to bring home a gold medal. But since I've been a young lad, I have had my eyes on a different prize. You see, each one of us is in a greater race than any I've run in Paris. And this race ends when God gives out the medals. A year after his Olympic success, Eric in 1925 will return to northern China as a missionary to follow in the footsteps of his parents. China became a very dangerous place in 1931 when the Japanese invaded. In 1943, Eric was interned as a Japanese prisoner of war and the conditions in the camp were awful that included hard labour and with few provisions. Eric suffered a brain tumour and died on the 21st of February 1945, five months before liberation. The life of Eric Liddell was a huge inspiration in my life as a young teenager, as I was a keen runner representing my school in cross country and once representing the county of Dorset. I was so inspired by Eric Liddell's autobiography that I decided I would not run or compete on Sundays. I faced some ridicule at school for my stance in putting God first, but it taught me from a young age only to fear God and not man. Eric's story also helped me to make a stand for God, to stand up for his principles at school, even though I was two years academically behind the rest of my peers. But running gave me notoriety, even though it was difficult to be a Christian in the late 1980s. I still draw inspiration from the life of Eric Liddell 
And uh, when I watch one of my favorite films, Chariots of Fire, I still swell up with emotion. Eric achieved success in his life because he always put the Lord first and he surrendered his life to Jesus in his entirety. He refused to compromise and rather than please man, he served God. I believe that is why the Lord honored him with gold in the Paris Olympics in 1924. I believe that today God is looking for young men and women who are willing to abandon their lives over to Jesus completely and surrender their lives to him so that he can use their lives as his amazing testimony in this dying world, just as Eric Liddell did in his day. Well, we have a fresh-faced Simon uh, there. Thank you for that info on Eric Liddell. Uh, we are live and interactive this evening. Please, viewers, uh, we appreciate your interaction. The question we're asking, what lessons can we learn from Olympian Eric Liddell? And definitely we um, have already seen some things that I'm sure we can glean on, and uh, especially his wholesale devotion um, in, in faith to God and how that wasn't just something theoretical. It wasn't just about um, a system of belief. It was about practice. It, it was about um, living his life in such a way um, that it was a testimony to um, God's power working in him. Absolutely. And I, I, I think, you know, looking back almost 100 years on uh, from the Paris Olympics of 1924, I think we can't really comprehend the pressure that would have been placed upon Eric Liddell, mainly from the authorities, but also from the media. And if you consider that sport wasn't, it was developed, but it wasn't that de well developed. So we don't have the large number of uh, sports that we do now, and the number of superstars as we do now com compared to then. So. Uh, he was a, a national icon even back then. I mean, he was loved in Scotland because, uh, you know, he was there, one of the fastest wingers uh, for the, the uh, national rugby team up in Scotland. Um, he was our gold medal prospect mm. uh, going into the Paris Olympics. And then to say, look, the heats fall on a Sunday, I'm not competing. And to face the ridicule that he did by putting God first um, and, and then facing the wrath of the Olympic Committee, the entire nation. I mean, even people in Scotland were calling him traitor yeah. uh, for putting God before king and country. But he did it. Uh, and he stood on his principles. And, mm. you know, and to face that pressure to do that when you're the favourite, to do that and then to actually compete in the 400 metres, which he hadn't had much practice in at all, uh, he wasn't expected to do well at all in that one because he was up against two world record holders uh, in the Americans um, and no one gave him a chance. Also, he was in the outer lane, which if you know anything about running a 400 wow. metres, that is the worst lane to be in because you have to lead from the front, you're in the front for the bit, but you can't see anyone behind you, so you can't control the race. Usually if you're in like lane two or three is the best lane, you can see the athletes in front of you, then you can catch up with them. But because he was in that outer lane meant that he couldn't see anyone until he kind of felt them on that home straight. And his quote was, I'm just going to run the hardest 200 metres of my life. And, and with God's help, I can run even faster for the second. And that's what happened. And, and I love the scripture that he was given by his coach. I mean, we saw in that um, video I just showed from um, Chariots of Fire that uh, Jackson Schultz gives him a little note mm. before the race, which says, I will honour those who... I will honour those who honour me, and the Lord certainly honoured him. And the fact that we are still talking about this Olympics, almost 100 years on, uh, you realise that God did something incredibly special through the life of uh, Eric Liddell. And in, in order for him to do that, we realised that he had to first work in Eric's heart and mind and bring him to um, those convictions. And so if we go back to some of the foundation of that, Eric was a star athlete. He uh, comes across as still a very private individual, very humble um, guy from everything uh, that we, we can glean. There's um, not tons of press about him before um, 1924, um, particularly in dealing with his faith. But um, he was asked to participate 
in an evangelistic event. He had never participated in any Christian event, as far as we're aware of, um, prior to 1923, just a year before the Paris Olympics. Um, and then in 1923, he's asked to speak at this event in Armadale in West Lothian. Um, it was linked to um, the Glasgow Student Union um, event. And so, you know, it's, it's likely that he was um, a disciple and recognized as a follower of Jesus um, to have been asked to speak at this evangelistic event, but he had never been very open in his confession of Jesus up to that point. Um, but it, it was from that point um, that his spiritual race really seems um, to take off. And um, it was immediately following that that Scotland's national press was saying, look, our, this star athlete is actually an evangelist. It was covered in the national press. Um, prior to that, uh, a couple of years later, Eric would r relay his feelings on that first occasion of, of testifying to um, the gospel, and, and this is how his words were reported. Years ago, he had been faced with the greatest problem of his life. He had been asked to assist a campaign in Armadale, and at that time, he had not addressed a gathering and was very reluctant about accepting. On the following morning, he received a message from his sister which contained the text, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I will guide thee. That text had helped him to make his decision, and since then he has endeavored to do the work of his master. Uh, the, these were um, how his words were conveyed in 1925, a year after the Paris Olympics, as he is preparing to return um, against all you know, expectations from many who see this is a, a bright young spark. He's going to, um, maybe he'll have more Olympic glory, maybe he'll um, come back and help um, you know this Scotland rugby team on to greater victories. Uh, he's on his way back to China to be a missionary to proclaim the gospel. And of course he didn't defend his title in uh, Amsterdam in 1928, uh, which mm. he could well have done. I mean, being a, a world record holder, Olympic uh, gold medalist, uh, that temptation would have been huge. But I think he knew that the calling on his life was was China, but I like the quote that he says that, you know, that God made me fast. Uh, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I mean, that was mentioned in the Chariots of Fire film. That was also mentioned in, in so many of his actual quotes. But there is no doubt about it that he was uh, completely uh, devoted to the Lord. His life had, uh, was surrendered to the Lord. And the one thing I think we can learn from his life, Reagan, is that we don't need to fear man, but we need to fear God. We put God first and we fear God, then we fear man and let God deal with the consequences. And uh, certainly did. Tim says something very similar uh, that fits in with that. Simon, muscular Christianity left a great legacy. We should honor this legacy and be more muscular in our Christian witness in these times of muscular secularism. And like you, Simon, I look forward to seeing Eric in heaven when the medals are handed out. Great program. Thank you. That's, that's Thank a great you. quote, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, Luke, I'll read some of his quotes now. These are some of the quotes from Eric himself. He says, In the dust of defeat, mm -hmm. as well as the laurels of victory, there is a glory to be found if one has done his best. And I mentioned this one. God made me fast when I run. I feel his pleasure. Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. It says, I have no formula for winning the race. Everyone runs in her own way or his own way. And where does the power come from? Uh, to see the race to its end, from within. Uh, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If with all your hearts you truly seek me, you shall ever surely find me. If you commit yourself to the love of Christ, then that is how you run a straight race. And I'm just going to read this last quote. I love this one. It says, the secret of my success over the 400 meters is that I run the first 200 meters as fast as I can. Then for the second 200 meters, with, God help, with God's help, I run faster. So um, his biographer had this to say about his testimony and uh, about people's reaction to his 
um, actions on behalf of the conviction he had that he should not run on the Lord's Day. Um, D.P. Thompson, there were some who said and very many more who feared that Eric's participation in evangelistic work might have an adverse effect on his running. Apart from anything else, an additional interest and activity of uh, such an absorbing kind might impede his progress as an athlete. And to some degree, I guess we could say um, it did in, in one way. As you said, he didn't go to Amsterdam. He, he, he didn't attempt to um, continue breaking the records that he was breaking. But um, people were disappointed because he's recognized as a coming British star. Um, the thing is, it had exactly the opposite effect. Following his uh, taking of this stand, following his uh, profession of faith and his being recognized prior even to the Olympics as an evangelist, the three months immediately following his open confession of Christ and his emergence as an evangelist, Eric ran more brilliantly and achieved greater distinction as a sprinter than in all the years that had gone before. And so um, that's a real testimony to that quote um, that you gave, when I run, well, God made me fast, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Um, we, we have um, here another, thank you, um, Simon, for that tribute. It was very moving, especially when our young people of this generation think that serving God is boring. God indeed does honor those who honor him. He never fails. Thank you for that, Mary. Absolutely. So I had the uh, pleasure earlier today to interview uh, Sue Cantor, who is the niece of Eric Liddell, and she's also the patron of the Eric Liddell Centre up in uh, Edinburgh. And they uh, do a fantastic work uh, reaching out to the elderly, uh, for those with dementia. And, and this is also a continuation of Eric's incredible legacy. So here's the interview that I recorded with Sue earlier today. And it's such a great honour that we are joined on Behind the Headlines by Sue Caton, who is the niece of Eric Liddell, but also the patron of the Eric Liddell Centre in Edinburgh. Um, Sue, can I just say it's such an honour that you're able to join us on Behind the Headlines tonight. Uh, and can I say personally that uh, Eric Liddell has been such an incredible inspiration in my life. I remember reading his autobiography when I was 13 at school. I was a uh, into athletics, I was into running, and uh, his life story absolutely inspired me. Uh, and as a young Christian as well, I uh, decided that I wouldn't run on Sunday. So he's been a huge inspiration to me. And then, of course, saw the incredible film uh, Chariots of Fire. But can I ask you, what are your earliest memories of knowing about Eric? Because sadly, he died in, uh, in China in a Japanese um, prisoner of war camp in 1945 but what are your early memories of being told about um, Eric Little? I think possibly when I was about six or seven we went to a church service and I do remember that and it was in Glasgow and my dad's eldest brother Rob he spoke there I think that was the first time I was really aware of him as being somebody that other people apart from the family um, knew about because I think up until then, I was probably too little or too young to have appreciated that. But I would be, it must have been about 1955 or something like that, 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 that those services were taking place. Probably a 10 years after he died, I would imagine, something like that. So that was my first real recollection of knowing about him as somebody, not just as my father's brother. Uh, and Sue, can you share with us um, the impact that the uh, the Hollywood film Chariots of Fire that uh, won those uh, incredible Oscars really brought the story of Eric Liddell and uh, Harold Abrahams to a completely new generation? And uh, Many people probably wouldn't even heard of Eric Liddell had it not been for that incredible film that is now this year celebrating its 40th anniversary. Oh, it had a huge impact. And of course, because America fell in love with it, <laughs> that was the big thing. And, and strangely enough, I went on a lacrosse tour to America not long after it had been uh, 
released and you'd have thought I was in the film and was the star of the show. It was incredible. But no, it, it's true. It brought it to life and, and it did so in a very realistic way where people could kind of relate to um, because they, they could see that, you know, the Olympics by then had become a much bigger event as well. And everybody was glued to their television to watch it all. And so, you know, it was, it was thing, something that people could relate to in their life. And the fact that he gave up the opportunity, I think was probably to some people quite amazing. Uh, but uh, of course, um, he, he certainly silenced his critics by then going on to win the, the 400, which was just fantastic. So, oh, you, know, wow. I mean, you know, I think, I think that, that part was probably something that really sparked people's imagination. Uh, absolutely. And, and can you share something about his um, incredibly devout um, Christian beliefs that, that, that Eric would not compete on a Sunday, believing that this was the Lord's day, the Sabbath, um, and was even going to sacrifice his place in, in the finals for the 100 metres, in which he was one of Britain's favourites to actually possibly win gold in the 100 metres? Yes, well, I mean... Obviously, it was a principle and he wasn't going to change it for anybody else. It was his decision. He never did, obviously, train or run. Well, I don't know about training, but he certainly wouldn't run in a competition or anything that was organised on a Sunday because he's, he, that was his day for his religion and for, um, for remembering Jesus Christ. So, you know, he was never going to change that, um, no matter what anybody said. And I don't think he really had any problem making that decision. I'm sure it was a decision that he made with great ease. It wasn't a problem to him to make it. Uh, and Sue, can you share with us any conversations that you've had with your family members about Eric? Um, I mean, we know that he was an incredible man of incredible principle. Uh, he loved the Lord. He loved athletics. He loved China. He loved the people of China. And ultimately, that cost him his life. But what do your family say about him, about his personality and about his character? Well, you see, I do think he had quite a good personality. I think he had a, a bit of mischief within him. And that comes from me talking to his eldest daughter, Patricia, and also to his wife, Flo Florence, whom I did meet because she came over several times with Patricia um, to, to stay with Auntie Jenny. And of course, we went across to meet them. And there is a little story about him uh, wanting to have his uh, second daughter called Heather. And uh, Florence, his wife, was keen on Carol. And so they had to do a draw lots. And he put Heather on every single straw so that it was about to come out as Heather. You know, I think he, he had a, 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 a different side to him. He wasn't totally serious, but he was a dedicated athlete. There is no question about that. And just as in the same way, he was a dedicated person. He wanted to outreach everybody. He, he loved all people. He, he didn't hate any person, no matter how... He, other people may have looked on him as being nasty or horrible or what, particularly in the Japanese situation. He, he didn't have any feelings that way towards anybody else. That, that's uh, something uh, I get uh, feeling about. Uh, and so Eric is considered um, in, in Scotland as being one of the greatest ever Scotsmen, certainly one of the greatest ever Scottish sportsmen. Um, not only did he win gold for uh, Great Britain, also Scotland as well in the 400 metres, won bronze in the 200 metres event in, in Paris 1924, but also uh, gained six caps for uh, Scotland in international rugby. Uh, he is loved on behalf of the Scottish people, together with the uh, the Chinese people as well. What would you say is the legacy of Eric Little? Well, the legacy that has been created for him is the Eric Little Centre, of course, but his own legacy is just the fact that people still talk about him because he's still remembered. He's still, people still bring up his name and he, he appears on um, programmes on um, television or in magazines or in the newspapers. You know, so his story about his own personal life has never been forgotten. So to me, that is a huge legacy um, that people still remember what he stood for. And I, I think he would be quite amazed if he knew that, because I don't think he was the sort of person that, well, he certainly didn't seek, um, you know, notoriety or seek um, anything, you know, he wasn't that kind of person. But I'm sure underneath he'd be very pleased to know that um, what he did and what he stood for other people respect and think, you know, take it as being something to, to uh, rejoice in, really. Absolutely. Uh, and Sue, can you share with us um, the work being carried out by the Eric Little Centre up in 
Edinburgh because you, you are the patron of this organisation that actually bears Eric's name. Yes, well, the main thing that the, the centre is focusing on is care for people with dementia who need help and also for the carers who are looking after them because, you know, they're just as important because they have a very difficult life. And they also give um, meals for people who require maybe a hot meal. And uh, they, they like to embrace uh, lots of different societies who can come in and use the premises. And of course, we charge the money for them to use it so that we can, we can uh, then use that money as well as money that's raised uh, to, to put forward to the care of the dementia. Excellent. Uh, my final question to you, Sue, is um, are you enjoying the uh, Tokyo 2020, the delayed Olympics? And, and does it conjure up a kind of thoughts of, of Eric uh, running that incredible 400 metres in, in which he, no one believed that he stood a chance going against two world record holders, not only winning gold, but also uh, um, breaking a new world record in the process? Well, yes, yeah, so far I've been finding it difficult to sleep because it's all in the middle of the night, which is a bit of a nuisance. But um, the, the star turns for me. Well, I enjoy the gymnastics too, but the star bit will be when the athletics start and they haven't yet started. But yes, I'll be rather glued to the television, but I'm also looking forward to the possibility of uh, 1924 in Paris being the 100th anniversary of Eric's run, because again, I'm sure this will bring some extra... Uh, people into the into the fold to know a little bit more about Eric because it's bound to be broadcast around. But no, absolutely. Is. I think it'll be very special to mark the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, not only for Harold Abrahams, but, but also yeah, for well, the yes, man course. himself. Eric Liddell as well and his legacy lives on uh, which is incredible so thank you so much for joining us for this very special interview on Behind the Headlines. You're welcome, you're welcome it's been pleasant to talk to you, thank you uh, Here's a couple of other emails, we have this from Anita, hi Simon and Reagan it's lovely to see you both, Eric Liddell was a good man and he put his faith First, I think the lesson for us all is to put God first. Following your beliefs isn't always the easiest path, as the biblical prophets and the disciples showed. But our rewards are in heaven, and we are called to put our faith first and make a stand. We cannot do anything on our own. I know everything I've achieved is only through God. To him be the glory. In all things, look to God and lean not on our own understanding. Matthew um, 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Blessings. We have a couple also who have drawn attention to um, Jonathan Edwards, who at one point was a professing evangelical Christian, but um, I'm sad to inform viewers um, in recent years has um, abandoned that profession and is living as an atheist now, which is um, a tragedy. Um, but that's a real tragedy. Yeah, it, it is. Um, we, we see uh, in the example of Eric Little, uh, a man not only who w was about his sporting career, we see Simon, someone who, as the quote you mentioned earlier, he was looking beyond that. This was only a part of his life. It was um, for a season, but ultimately, uh, Eric is so much more than the 1924 Paris Olympic Games. We see that um, really without that, we probably wouldn't be talking all that much about um, his legacy. We, we might not know his name, we might know it. Um, the missionary organization that his family had gone out with originally, um, the London Missionary Society, was known to have sent out David Livingston um, to Africa. Um, it also sent out um, James Gilmore to Mongolia, and um, Eric's father was uh, only the, the second uh, missionary after Gilmore to be involved with the Mongols. So th there's a heritage that's there, but if Eric had not stood on that conviction to honor God before any other man, I don't think we'd be having this conversation right now. No, I don't think we would. I don't think we would be having this conversation, but the fact that uh, God gave him uh, an incredible talent when it come, came to running and athletic prowess, um, the fact that he then became famous. I mean, I, I think, you know, this is, this is, this is where I, I, I think we really have 
an understanding of, of who he is. Mm. Because in 24, after 1924, he's won Olympic gold, he won bronze in the, uh, in the 200. Um, he, was, he was an Olympic legend. Yeah. And gave it all up a year later. Gave all of that up, all that fame. Uh, he could have become rich. He could have then competed in the Amsterdam Olympics in 28 to regain his title. Uh, he, he could have done what Harold um, Abrahams did and followed, had a career in athletics because Harold Abrahams went on to become a BBC journalist. He even reported um, during the awful 1936 Berlin mm. Olympics uh, in Berlin, well, the height of those anti-Semitic pogroms and, and everything else that we saw in Nazi Germany at the time. He then went on to become the, uh, uh, the head or the director of the uh, British Athletics Association. Um, so that could have been an easy path for him. But no, he, he chose to go to China. Uh, he chose to go back to where, his, where he was born uh, and where his parents were missionaries. And, and the fact is that when we look at the Chinese, the Chinese also consider him a hero. This, this is the, the interesting thing, is that the Chinese people loved him. Uh, and he was also then considered a hero in China as well. So he's not only loved by the Scots, and rightly so, but he's also so loved by the, by the Chinese. And that's an incredible legacy that he's left behind. The fact that he died in um, a Japanese concentration camp three, year, three months before the end of the war, the end of World War II. The fact that he chose to stay with the Chinese people and their plight, uh, and his wife and his children fled to Canada to go back home when the, uh, the fighting intensified, uh, showed his love and his commitment to the Chinese people. Uh, and, you know, so he, you know, an incredible, inspirational, remarkable man where, where sacrifice is at the heart of who he is. And he was consistent. Some might think, well, uh, did Eric ever regret that decision? Actually, he realized that uh, the 400 meters was his race to run. He, he would say uh, that had he not experienced that um, period of time, and there was about a year, it's not conveyed accurately in the film, uh, he knew for about a year that he would not be running um, in the, the 100 meters, he knew that it was on the Lord's Day and there was a lot of back and forth, to and fro and a lot of pressure, as you mentioned. But were it not for that, he would not have realized, actually, the 400 meters, it, that was his race to run. And in, in God's providence and sovereignty, he ran that race very, very well. Um, fast forward a bit and he's, he's come back from China on um, a brief break with his family. And the topic is still something that's bothering him. It's still on his mind. And so um, there was an event, a meeting, where um, he, he put across um, this meeting is of the opinion that the increasing use of the Lord's Day for games and recreations, however harmless in themselves, is detrimental to the highest interests of the youth of the country, as well as adding to the amount of unnecessary labor of other people, and calls on all young people's organizations to give full consideration to this aspect of the question. And um, th th that question being, okay, is this actually something that we should be continuing? Now, um, Simon, I, with, with a, a young son, myself, uh, enjoying um, sport, I, I would love for Randall to be able to participate in sport. Uh, I would love for him to be able to um, play football or rugby or uh, whatever. American football, or, yeah. or, or, well, or baseball. Uh, it, whichever, <laughs> it, it could be any of those. Um, um, I'd love to get him involved in something, but how many sports are now almost, uh, when it comes to uh, children and families, almost exclusively being played on Sundays, with few exceptions? I can think um, in, in rugby of um, some clubs that they, they have, um, you know, some exceptions, and I, we can think in recent days of the um, a fellow Scotsman of Eric's, um, Ewan Murray, who is um, a Christian. He uh, played for Northampton Saints and um, also for the Scotland national rugby team. He similarly uh, refused to play on Sundays, again, with loads of you know, criticism and, and pressure from various people and that kind of you know, sneer, you know, you're self-righteous type um, re reaction from other people. But I think we have to take an honest look at our society and uh, acknowledge 
Eric was right. We allowed other things to come in and crowd out what our supreme focus should be, um, that is, the Lord and worship of him on this day. No, absolutely. No, I, I, I agree, and maybe this is time to kind of reflect on how special the, uh, the, the Sabbath is uh, and the Sunday. I mean, for example, if, uh, if, if we take, uh, you know, uh, Judaism, um, the Shabbat is something that is, is very special. It's, it's a day where the TVs are turned off, no cookers are on, um, no, no, no hot cooking, and it's a day spent going to synagogue and then reflecting on the week. Uh, computers are uh, shut down, phones are turned off, every electronic gizmo and gadget mm -hmm. are turned off that completely dominates our lives. And there's a day of complete refreshment. And uh, to actually participate in such a day is, is something you know, to behold, and, and that's what it would have been like in Eric's time. But we also see the growing influence of commercialism, even back then, um, and the demand for sporting events to take place on a Sunday. I think the fact that it, it took the Olympics took place in, in Paris rather than London is also a major factor because we know that, that France is very secular, so the whole concept of, of Sunday it is, is not really regarded as a special day as it mm. was in England. And, and maybe things would have been different if, if London had hosted the uh, Olympic Games. I don't know. But it does raise some very important questions, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, by the time he's in China, his family, um, they're able to escape. He is eventually put in a concentration camp. And one might think, well, under the pressure, unideal circumstances to sort of ease some of the drudgery and pain of that experience, maybe he would um, make some compromises there. But even in the concentration camp, he refused um, to be involved in the organizing of um, sporting events and other games on the Lord's Day. He, he kept to that. He um, ran Sunday school. He would um, teach from the Bible. He would um, organize events in the other days of the week. Uh, this is uh, from Norman Cliff, who was with Eric in the concentration um, camp. He said, we, we arrived on Loy's from the Wishian station and were uh, driven through the front gate of the camp with its three Chinese characters, meaning courtyard of the happy way. This was the name given to what had been a large American Presbyterian mission station, but it was not a particularly apt slogan as a Japanese camp for 2,000 inmates. We were lined up uh, the church uh, camp, the, the camp church, while uh, the Japanese commandant read out the regulations, warning us that any non-compliance would be severely dealt with. Then we were surrounded by dozens of the local internees who had already been here for five months. They were tanned, thin, and barefoot, looking like creatures from another world. We realized that it would not be long before we would have a similar appearance. They spoke with British, American, and continental accents. Within a few days of arriving, a fellow um, Chifu boy pointed to a man standing nearby in a group of people and said, that's Eric Liddell, the man who refused to run on a Sunday at the Olympics. The man in question was bald and tanned, a friendly smile and wearing khaki shorts and was barefoot. We'd been brought up on this story of his stand on Sunday sport, which coincided with our own strict Sabbatarian upbringing. Little seemed to be ubiquitous. He was all over the camp holding friendly conversation with all kinds of people. The camp labor committee had designated him to divide his time between teaching and organizing youth sports. Soon he was organizing races. He goes on to say he gave science classes to school groups, um, although he had no equipment or blackboard, um, he, he was uh, in, in every way taking a, a fatherly interest in the children, probably um, in large part because by that point he was missing um, his own children. Um, he continued to um, teach from the Bible, um, Sunday school, and continued to um, quote from memory um, passages of scripture impressing on people um, the truths therein. And then uh, in February 1945, about five months before the end of the war, um, the writer says we were playing outside the camp hospital 
Uh, the nurse on duty passed a note out of the window. Eric Liddell would like you to play Finlandia. We gladly obliged and played it, thinking of the words, Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Uh, during the week which followed, 21st February 1945, Eric Liddell died five months before the end of internment. So um, e even in his, um, his dying moments, brain tumor, he's, he was still set on this final prize. And one email um, that we have says it, another lesson from Eric Liddell, he finished the race. Indeed he did. Uh, and I think that's a good way to end the program, essentially, is, is that we all have, we're all running a race. This is a spiritual race. It's not a sprint, but it's a marathon. And it's not how we start the race, but how we finish the race. So we've got to finish well, because we know that God, at the end, will hand out the medals. And um, I, I think that is, is very fitting. That's something that we, we can learn uh, from Eric's life, that he, it was a, a life of sacrifice, it was a life of dedication for the Lord. It was one of putting God first rather than man first. And um, the way that, that God used him in, in the most powerful and the most remarkable way. And the fact that we are approaching almost, you know, we're in the 97th anniversary of, uh, of the Paris Olympic Games in 1924, that we're still talking about him, it shows you what an incredible legacy that he had left behind. And I think that comes from a surrendered life. Uh, um, well, that's putting the Lord first mm. uh, in everything. Uh, and, and then the Lord glorifying him uh, throughout his life, whether it was competing on the track or being a missionary in China. Um, we all know the name Eric Liddell. And I think also that the film Chariots of Fire also this year celebrating its 40th anniversary has really uh, brought that incredible story and rivalry between Harold um, Abrahams and Eric Liddell uh, to the public conscience. And of course, when the Olympics is on, this also again is another reminder of the greatest mm. Olympic story ever told. Absolutely. I want to encourage uh, viewers, maybe after the program, take uh, your, your Bibles and go to Hebrews 11 and 12 and, and read them together. Um, one follows after the other and you'll see this um, great um, picture of men and women of faith. And then in Hebrews 12, uh, we read that um, having this in mind, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, um, let us um, press forward in enduring this particular race, casting aside all sin that clings closely, running um, the race um, toward our, uh, the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. It will be agonizing at times. There will be pain. There will be difficulty. Um, th there will be moments of, of real um, heartache even as we um, experience the outworking of our faith. Certainly, um, Eric Liddell would have experienced those challenges. Um, and yet, if we look to Jesus we know that just as Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, we too can face those trials and those difficulties um, with a renewed, hope-filled perspective. So um, let that be an encouragement to you. Absolutely. And Reagan, I think it's also a good reminder that we can always uh, watch the great film again, which mm. is uh, Chariots of Fire, which is an absolutely inspirational film. And, um, you know, I think, I think this has been an exciting program today to talk about the life of Eric Liddell, um, one of God's heroes and uh, an inspiration to you and an inspiration to me. Uh, and it's fantastic. So do you want to sum up uh, the program? Yeah, I would encourage every um, everyone definitely have a look at that film, maybe get the soundtrack playing, enjoy uh, the Olympics as you watch them, um, and l look at how you can, where you are in this moment, be faithful um, to the Lord in day-to-day -day life. Um, this is Behind the Headlines. We love you and we'll look forward to um, joining next week. We hope you have um, a very blessed rest of this week.